And I'm very pleased that she's come. I have to say that in my work in arranging speakers for um, this program, I have found nothing but generosity, good humor, and incredible energy from Sherlockians, from people who are interested in, devoted to, playing around with the legacy of Sherlock Holmes. And, um, and Laurie King is one of them. Uh, Laurie King is a best-selling and award-winning author of a number of different series of detective novels. Um, most tellingly for our purposes here, the Mary Russell series. Um, I actually brought in my copy of the most, of the first of the books, um, The Beekeeper's Apprentice, which I hope to have signed before I, before <laughs> Ms. King leaves. Um, but the most recent book, Garment of Shadows, is actually on sale now by the bookstore here, and they'll be in front um, if you want to purchase that before you leave and maybe get a signature of your own inside. Um, she is also, along with last week's speaker, Leslie Klinger, she's the co-editor of um, A Study in Sherlock's, which is a collection of stories um, which are inspired by, play upon, um, do homage to Sherlock Holmes stories, another great work for people to look at. Um, she lives and writes in Santa Cruz, so we were very lucky that we had California folks who were Sherlockians of great note. Um, it's great privilege and a great pleasure to be able to introduce you to Lori King. Before somebody uh, breaks their neck on a pin. Good afternoon. It is afternoon, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I, it's always nice to know I haven't crossed a time zone on traveling the Bay Area. I love the idea of being a work of literary merit. Thank you very much for considering me being of, of merit. Um, I write a series, and if you would kind of let me know if um, you suddenly can't hear me, because it'll mean I've accidentally turned something out or got disrupted or something. Machines and I aren't always on the same planet. Um, I write a series in which um, young Mary Russell, you probably want the lights on me, don't you? Um, young Mary Russell meets Sherlock Holmes in 1915. And I started writing when I was in my 30s. My two kids had gone to uh, preschool two glorious mornings a week. <laughs> 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 and I sat down and wrote, I was 15 when I first met Sherlock Holmes. 15 years old with my nose in a book as I walked the Sussex Downs and nearly stepped on him. Um, and it was one of those really um, very, very blessed um, experiences as a writer when the character that you are trying to shape in the back of your mind actually takes place um, without thinking about it, without working on it without ripping bits out of the book and putting them elsewhere and saying, no, that's not working. Um, this character of Mary Russell was just as she appeared on that first day. And I've now, I'm now working on the 13th, I think, book, um, which will be out in a little over a year. So they're presented as her memoirs, uh, which is, I, I think typical of, um, of new writers. It's always easiest, you think, it's easiest to write in first person. Um, and y then you get three books into it and you think, oh, but there's stuff here I can't do in the first person, which is really difficult. Then you try and figure out, should I change and make this a you know, narrative in third person or should I just plow ahead? So. Um, I thought I, what I would do is talk to you for a few minutes about my experience um, with the Sherlock Holmes material. And then because you're a mixed group, I will open it to questions and you can ask me about writing or how I feel about ripping off Conan Doyle or you know, the vast money that there is in writing <laughs> fiction or <laughs> any of those kinds of things. So, so I started writing <coughs> when I was 35, um, 1987. And 
Um, I, I wrote about three sentences before I realized that I was in a difficult position in that the main character is a young woman, yes, but the second character in the books is this guy named Sherlock Holmes. And I knew nothing, nothing about Sherlock Holmes. I think that there must have been one of those Granada television series, you know, the ones with Jeremy Brett. Um, I think those must have been going on because I was not somebody who had read this material since I was in high school, which you probably will gather it was a while ago. Um, and I think even then I probably read, what, what is it, The Speckled Band and Hound of the Baskervilles, something like that. So I was by no means a Sherlockian. Um, so, but being, being an academic, I had at the time just finished, I guess, my master's degree in, in theology. And so um, being an academic, the, the, your first impulse is to go out and get a book. Whatever it is, you get a book and you read it and then, then you're a master of the whole thing. You know, you know everything. So fortunately, I started with the actual stories instead of reading about Sherlock Holmes, which would have put me in a whole different world. But so I went out and got this uh, two volume uh, mass market size, the small size paperback, about that thick, teeny, teeny, teeny print. I, I, I don't think I could re read it now, my eyes being 30 years older. Um, and, and I started to read my way through the stories so that I discovered this character, Sherlock Holmes, as an adult rather than as a kid. Um, I'm always amused that they're, when, when you find them at, marketed as children's fiction, because they're really not. I mean, they're adventures, but they're, um, they're far, from, far from kids' material. Um, and, I, and I found, to my surprise, that it was a much more complex person than I had anticipated. You sort of think of Holmes as being a thinking machine, um, a guy who figures stuff out before anyone else does and is really snooty about it. Um, and I found instead this, this much more complex character who, um, who had friendships he didn't know how to deal with, who had passions that entirely infused his life, and whose, whose absolute commitment to setting things right um, ruled everything in, in his existence. So, and one of the other things that I, that I found in there that I really, really hadn't expected was humor. Now, I don't know how many of you are, are, have um, m much contact with British people and their humor, but it, it's, it takes you aback. Um, because it's very dry, not always. I mean, sometimes it's slapstick. We've all seen British television. Um, but sometimes you get this very dry, um, understated kind of humor that makes you giggle wildly because it's so unexpected. So you're reading along, and, and here's Watson stumbling in to the rooms on Baker Street. And it's so smoky in there from Holmes's pipes that he can't see, so he blindly fights his way across the room and flings open the door and, and then spots Holmes sitting there as the smoke begins to clear and he says, Holmes, what are you doing? And, and Holmes says, I, I find a concentrated atmosphere helps the mind to concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> and you're reading this thinking, is that a joke? <laughs> and then he goes on to say, I have not taken this theory so far as to get into a box to think, but <laughs> and I thought, now this is a character I could really get behind. This is a man who, yes, has capabilities, but he also has a sense of humor. So I, I was very pleased to discover that because um, what I started doing with the books was writing a, a humorous take. I mean, they're not slapstick books but they are definitely um, with, with a sense of humor. And I think that Mary Russell um, has taken over these sorts of sides of, of Holmes. She is and was intended to be from the beginning a sort of young female feminist 20th century version of the great detective, vastly superior model. <laughs> 
I wouldn't say that to Sherlockians, you understand. <laughs> I, I don't say that when I go to the Baker Street dinner in January in New York. I, I, I smile politely and say, yes, yes. But I can say, she's much better. <laughs> um, so I started writing these stories, and I, I wrote a, um, a, a number of them around various um, themes, that some of which I picked up from the, uh, from the Conan Doyle stories, and some of them are, were completely different. Um, one of the early ones is called The Moor, and in it they go back to um, Dark Moor, where The Hound of the Baskervilles, of course, is set. And it has partly to do with The Hound of the Baskervilles, but it also has to do with a, a lot of other things that are going on. Uh, one of the joys of doing historical research is you come across these utterly unlikely figures. And if they overlap even sort of vaguely with your period that you needed to be there, um, it's just such a joy because you come across someone like uh, the Reverend Sabine Baring Gould, who is the, the fellow who wrote, you know, the hymn Onward Christian Soldiers? Marching as to war. Well, he also wrote um, a series of li lives of the saints um, for which he had no research library, so he just made it all up. <laughs> My kind of guy. And, um, and he's fairly well known as being, the, having written the definitive volume, A Natural History of Werewolves. <laughs> Not as a humorous book, either. Um, the man had a lot of kids and many, uh, and a church to support in, uh, in rural Dartmoor, and so he just wrote whatever he thought would sell, and that was, he wrote some sort of bodice-ripping novels, um, these unlikely books, and he happened to be there at a time. He also wrote a, a number of guides to Dartmoor, and he happened to be there and still alive when I needed him, so I could, I could grab onto him and make use of him um, in some very unlikely ways as indeed I did later when I set a book in San Francisco and discovered that Dashiell Hammett was in town, so I just dragged Dashiell Hammett in. Now, for those of you who are thinking of writing historical fiction, let me make a recommendation. Choose people who don't reproduce. <laughs> <laughs> because it is so disconcerting to find the grandchild of a person that you've just spent a year making up. So far, they've been quite generous, but um, I, I, my, my mind just had a really tough time when I went to a meeting in San Francisco that was dedicating a, an apartment that Dashiell Hammett had worked in, and his daughter was there, about 90 years old. And I, 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 I didn't, I said, I'm awfully sorry. I've just borrowed your father for an adventure. And she said, Oh, that's all right, dear. People have done worse. <laughs> <laughs> Which I, I, I thought, you know, okay, that, that's, uh, now I have to be really careful. And I still keep choosing people. That, um, so, well, sooner or later, I'll get a letter from somebody, and it'll be irate because they didn't have gray hair. It was black at the time or something. Um, so anyway, that's your point for the day. Don't, don't choose um, real-life people with a lot of kids if you can avoid it. Choose somebody who just didn't have any kids. Um, so at any rate, that's where I started, writing these, writing these um, Mary Russell adventures. And when I, um, when I was first beginning them, uh, I really wasn't, frankly, I wasn't terribly interested in Holmes, other than being a supporting character. And I, I thought it was more interesting to put the two of them together. Theoretically, I could have written a Mary Russell story without Sherlock Holmes, but in fact, it was much more interesting to put the two similar characters together um, because it allowed me to show how they were the same and how they were different and kind of bounce them off each other. Um, but as I got on with the series, I began to think about the character of Holmes as a person. And um, I, I mean, those of us who write fiction, we have a sort of shortcut way of talking about our characters that makes it sound as if we think they're real. Most of us don't, I guarantee you. Most of us have a fairly clear idea that no, they're, they're not actually real. 
Um, but it's easiest to talk about, you know, Mary Russell would have done this and Mary Russell did that. Well, to, to look at Holmes in that same way, um, and, and I, I will say that for those of you who firmly believe that, that Sherlock Holmes was indeed a, a, a real character, this also means that he is still alive because his obituary has yet to appear in the Times of London. <laughs> Even as a Rupert Murdoch paper, it would have the obituary <laughs> of Sherlock Holmes. Um, but I became more interested in the character of Holmes. And um, I began to see that he had a lot of potential as a character that I could develop. I, as a writer, could allow this character to grow in some very interesting ways. Because Conan Doyle stopped writing the Holmes stories at the, at the very eve of the Great War, at the very brink of World War I. He could never envision Sherlock Holmes during or after the war. He kept writing up until his death in the late 20s. But all of the stories he wrote were set before, either in Baker Street or during his retirement. So I looked at this and I thought, he would not have done that. If, if you have a character as extraordinary, a mind as supple and um, imaginative as Sherlock Holmes, he's not a person who would have just said, well, England is so different now, I'm going to crawl into a hole. Which basically is what Conan Doyle had posited. He kind of figured that there was no place for him in this hugely changed England. Um, the entire society turned upside down between 1914 and 1918. You know, women were given the boat for God's sakes. <laughs> what can Sherlock Holmes do with that? So, but I looked at him and I said, you know, I think that he would have developed as a character. I think that he would have changed. I think he would have found a way of life in this bigger world that existed after 1918. And, and so I think you can say, as my books go along, I've become more interested in the development of Holmes as a person. Um, and um, it's been interesting having conversations with the more devout Sherlockians, because at first, I think they assumed that I was, um, <laughs> I, I have a feeling they suspected I was about to start writing Sherlockian erotica. <laughs> Which, you, you know, you, you laugh, but really, it's a big, big genre. <laughs> um, and I, I think that only when I had written a few did did they stop? Now, you have to remember this is the first one was published in 1994. And so the internet was just getting started. That one of the early Sherlockian groups was called the Hounds of the Internet. And each book of mine that came out, apparently, um, I was flamed. The, you remember flame wars? I mean, they call them something different now. But there used to be these flame wars. And it was, it was a little a little depressing for them because I was completely unaware of them. <laughs> I had one of those modems that you dial up and you put the phone on, you know, I mean, flame wars were not my thing. So, but in, when I eventually discovered that I was being flamed in absentia, um, there were already a, a sort of movement in the Sherlockian world that said, well, you know, she's not writing erotica. Um, her really hot, steamy scenes are those where Holmes is brushing Russell's hair, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> playing with her fingers, you know, I mean, those are the really, really hardcore steamy scenes in those books. Um, and, and she has a, a fair amount of respect, not only for the character of Sherlock Holmes, but for Conan Doyle as well. And I think that at that point, um, the Sherlockian world began to grudgingly um, take me to their manly breasts. And, um, and, and began to listen to the, you know, some of the ideas that I put forward in the books, to the extent that I was asked to speak at the annual um, Sherlock Holmes um, celebration that takes place in New York in January every year. Can you imagine an annual event in January in New York? Um, but they, they, they do it. 
and I occasionally go. Um, but they asked me to give the lecture one year, which is a formal lecture, and so I gave it on a very abstruse topic and uh, was very pleased when nobody threw things at me and they, they and two years later they made me a, a member of the BSI. So I am now um, a proper BSI member. There's 300 and some of us in the, in the world and um, I, I, I didn't wear my little my little dot of a lapel pin because it disappeared somewhere. But um, it's, you know, it's really lovely to, to feel that I kind of um, am both allowed to speak heresy about Holmes and say things that all these things that he, nobody accepts that he did. And I'm also accepted as a proper Sherlockian. Um, Les Klinger is one of my good friends. How, how many of you were here for Les's thing? Isn't he fabulous? I mean, I just love Les. He's, he's, he's so energetic, you want to sign up for something, anything. Um, we have another, uh, another collection, hopefully, uh, coming out in another year or so, and it's going to be fabulous. We talked to all kinds of people, including Sarah Paretsky, and um, there's another graphic story that will be in it, which will be such fun. So, so I, I have this distinct advantage of walking both worlds. I can do what I want, but they, they take me seriously. So, Now, do we have any particular questions or topics that uh, clearly I can ramble on in any direction for uh, an hour, um, but you might have something that you would be particularly um, interested in hearing me say. It's if, hard to see in here. If so yeah. Conan Doyle wasn't your inspiration to write detective fiction as a star, who was your inspiration? If Conan Doyle was not my inspiration for writing detective fiction, who was? No, it's funny because when I, when I first sat down to write, um, if you had told me a few years earlier that I was going to be writing for a living, I would have assumed that I was going to write um, science fiction because I, I mostly read science fiction. I was a big sci-fi um, person. And I, I think that the difference was when I came to actually write a story, I found that I needed the kind of bones, the skeleton that you get um, from, from crime fiction. I mean, crime fiction has a definite pattern that, that the story has to be laid out on. You know, the beginning, it has an end, which a lot of mainstream fiction doesn't. Um, it has a sort of sequence of an, an untimely death to resolution and, and this kind of puzzle along the way. And it can bring in all kinds of really interesting st stuff, you know, so long as the story will support it. Um, crime fiction can be about anything from revenge to money to politics to stamp collecting to whatever. So long as it is a human passion, it, it, will, it will give you the energy to tell the, the novel. Um, and so as I, as I wrote, I found that I, I really felt at home in crime fiction. Um, what I do tends to be not so much the detective story as it is, they kind of classify it as suspense, meaning it's sort of halfway to being a thriller, but it kind of takes a little longer to get there. Um, and and I'm, I'm really comfortable with that. I know there's a lot of crime writers out there who get very grumpy about being a crime writer and we never get reviewed on the front page of the New York Times book review and all that. On the other hand, people buy our books. So, you know, it's kind of a trade-off. So I have nothing to complain about. Yes? Uh, you think that in your case, Ron, it's helpful to kind of do the modernization of Holmes. That's like, for example, there's been the American television show. Uh, my personal favorite, actually, is the one done by the BBC, mm -hmm. where they're bringing Holmes like, into the 20th century updating that sort of thing, your take on that. Yeah, the, the question is about the, uh, the modern retellings of Holmes from the, the sort of steampunk um, Robert Downey films to, uh, to Benedict Cumberbatch's. Um, I mean, I think that the BBC thing is just fabulous. I think that it's, it's so beautifully done and so cleverly written. It's not easy to write something that satisfies people who know every little bit and piece about the canon. Um, and to also tell a story that somebody who's never read a Sherlock Holmes short story will be able to follow. Um, it's, it's one of those things that you get these little nudges along the way. 
Uh, they're not perfect when it comes to plot. I, you sort of get to the end of them and you think, would that have <laughs> But I think that they're just, they're just so clever. Um, I, haven't, I haven't seen very many of the, the, the television series, the modernized television series. I've seen one or two of them, and they seem quite well done. I just, I don't stay up till 11 most of the time. <laughs> yes? age question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, early on, I think, I think it was for O Jerusalem, which is about the fifth book in, um, my publisher, Random House, took me to um, one of the big BE, BEA conferences. And part of the thing that they do when they take an author is they give away a ton and a half of their books. So they have you sitting at this little card table with a flower on it. Um, and, and the rope lines that, you know, here's the next person on that table. So you're sitting there and you can't see more than about three people because they're standing in a straight line. But my publisher is sitting, standing there behind me and you have to sort of envision Bette Midler, you know? <laughs> I mean, she's this really New Yorker, she's a New Yorker. And, and she's taking these books and she's kind of slapping them down in front of me like this, which kind of tells me that there's a lot of people in the line, and we are only here for an hour. So she, so I'm signing the books and saying, thank you, hope you enjoy it. Thank you, hope you enjoy it. Thank you. And this guy comes up and he sort of stops. And he leans forward, and this is always a bad sign. <laughs> leans forward and says, I had a question about this age difference between Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, my publisher is going, <laughs> so I say, my husband is 30 years older than I am, so I kind of have a good idea of what a 60-year-old man is capable of. <laughs> 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 Oops. <laughs> he turned bright red, absolutely bright red, grabbed the book and ran. <laughs> Bette Midler here is peeing her pants because I've made a dirty joke to it. And I'm saying what? You know, important stuff like chasing kids and taking out garbage cans. Why are you dirty minds here? <laughs> but I think that, um, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting question because I come, you know, as I said, my husband was 30 years older. And so I have a kind of skewed idea of what a relationship is supposed to look like. Um, but I think that in the early part of the 20th century, an awful lot of women were in a similar position to mine. That is, um, the only men you had at your, uh, you know, sort of the group that you could choose from were either severely wounded physically or mentally from the war or were older. And so the, it, was, it was, for a while in the 20s, you found an awful lot of these very, chronologically uneven um, marriages. Um, it seems to me there was even a theme about that in the Downton Abbey show, did you? Wasn't there one of the sisters who, but um, I, I think that it's, it's one of those areas that, um, I, interestingly enough, I had my first letter, and you know, Russell's been out for 20 years now. Um, I had my first letter a couple of weeks ago, an email from someone saying that she had a lot of problems with the Russell stories, that she'd read several of them and she liked them, but she just couldn't get past the fact that, that when they met, she was a child. And so wasn't this promoting pedophilia? And I didn't quite know how to answer that. I just kind of wrote back and said, what an interesting question. <laughs> Because I, I think that, um, you know, from the point of view, uh, f from the way the books are, the stories are told, it's not. On the other hand, if you're standing outside them, if you told me, there's this really keen book about a 15-year-old who meets and marries Sherlock Holmes, I'd say, okay, no, not for me, thanks. Um, so it's, it is one of those interesting questions that, you know, as a writer, I'm, I'm brought to be aware that I'm not always in control of my material. So. And, and I often don't know what I'm doing. 
role of women in the stories. Yeah, I think that the, um, the Sherlock Holmes stories in general, um, most of the time when women appear, y you know that the, something terrible is going to happen to them. I mean, you know, you, you really sort of dread seeing a woman as a client because she's not going to get the good, good stuff. Um, <clears throat> but I, I always love the fact that um, this the, the person who really, really beats him and the person that he can't ever quite shake in the stories is Irene Adler. Um, and I think that the Irene Adler story sets the sort of groundwork for the Russell stories. That is, here's a man who, who feels kind of paternalistic towards a lot of women. He feels um, that women have short shrift in life. I think that Holmes uh, shares Conan Doyle's attitude that women, women really got a, a raw deal a lot of times, but there wasn't much he could do with it except speak up when he could. Um, and, um, and help them out. And I think that a lot, of the, a lot of the appearance of women in the Conan Doyle stories is just that that they are um, women who were it under other circumstances would be very capable individuals. And I think we tend, we tend to call Sherlock Holmes a misogynist, but he, in fact, he's just, he doesn't like anybody, whether men or women. Um, and he has nothing in particular against women. He, I, I, I loved the BBC one where it takes uh, Irene Adler and makes her into a dominatrix because that's kind of taking it a little further but very much the same. He likes, the man likes strong women. What are the iconic substances or, or <coughs> objects for Mary Russell? Yeah, I think that um, the, the, the Holmes thing, you, you sort of, as a, as a Sherlockian, you get tired of saying, he never smoked that kind of pipe. He n only once is shown wearing a deer stalker. So, you know, but you're stuck with it because that's what they did on the stage from the very beginning. And so, okay. Um, and I think that the, it's been interesting to see what the Russellians have picked up because there is an entire community of Mary Russell fans. Um, and I, I have, um, I think that a lot of them, I know that a number of them have gone to Oxford because of poor old Russell. I, why, why Oxford should be cursed with poor old Mary Russell, I don't know. But there's a number of um, her fans have gone and done either summer programs or even degrees at Oxford because that's where Mary Russell went. Um, so that, you know, the literary side of things and the academic stuff is very much Russell. But I think as objects go, um, my, my brother-in-law is in love with her throwing knife. And I think, an, I think a lot of people like her throwing knife. I was at a, an event in Portland, of course, for Pirate King. Uh, and Pirate King is all about, as you might imagine, pirates. Well, in Portland, about two weeks before, there had been some big pirate event and so everybody still had their costumes out. So they all thought, oh, we'll go to Laurie's event in our costumes. And so I, I had this sea of pirate, you know, beards and women with, you know, and feathers of these people kind of trying to see around the feathers and hats. And this woman came up to me, and, and again, that's kind of lean over your table where you think, oh, God, what's wrong? Um, and, and she said, do you have a throwing knife? <laughs> And I sort of looked around to my escort and said, no. And she said, and slapped it down. <laughs> she gave me a throwing knife from her boot top, <laughs> where Maria Russell carries hers. And I, 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 have any of you ever seen a throwing knife? 
I mean, they are vicious. They really are. You handle them very carefully. They're these little slivers of metal that are just so sharp. And I said, oh, thank you very much, thinking, I'm on a plane tomorrow at 5 o'clock. What am I going to do with this? <laughs> anyway, I gave it to my brother, and he, he foolish boy, instead of driving down at Thanksgiving um, to, to bring it to me, he thought, oh, I'll just mail it to Lori. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he wraps it up in cardboard, right? and puts it in, in an envelope, just a plain old envelope, because they're not very big. They just, and I get this thing about three weeks later that repackaged, you know, the post office repackages things in plastic bags saying, this was damaged in shipping. It had a bend to it like this. That I, I don't, I'm glad they never sent me a bill for their sorting machine, because clearly it went through a machine and just, uh, so. So if any of you have throwing knives, I don't really need another one. It's OK, thanks. So, but I think the throwing knife is definitely iconic for Mary Russell. Yeah. yeah. How far ahead do you plan your plots? Like, do you know what's going to happen in the book acumen? Do you have plans for Sherlock aging out and his grandchild? How many clues in Mary's shoes or anything like that? Plans for Sherlock aging out. Um, <laughs> yeah, do I, how far in advance do I plan my books? Um, I am not an outliner. I rarely know, as I said, I really know what I'm doing. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, as far as long term with the stories, there's two or three kind of vague ideas that I'm, I'm working on. Um, the next book is going to be set partly in Japan and partly in Oxford. Um, it'll be out a year from this spring. Um, but I, I think that. Um, it's one of the reasons I've made the stories come so close together, because the, the, it was like eight of them covered a 10-month period. <laughs> so he may wear out, but he's not going to age out. Um, considering that I'm in my 60s now, and I probably won't write much past 120. Um, so it's, um, I, yeah, I don't think you need to worry. Some, some new generation of Laurie King may, may, may need to, but I'm not getting there. Yeah. Is it going to be a flashback like O. Jerusalem was? The question is, is it going to be a flashback like O. Jerusalem was? Um, the book, it, I got into real trouble uh, a few years ago when I wrote a book um, that ended with those dread words to be continued and promised people I would never do that again. So um, no, it's not going to be that kind of a flashback. It's going to be a two-part book, I think, partly in um, Japan in spring of 1924, and partly in England the following year when they get back after various places, including Morocco. This is one of the lovely things about writing a series in all parts of the world is that you have to go there. I mean, the things that I do for you people. <laughs> yes, you, you had a question, yeah. What happens to Watson in the book? What happens to Watson? Poor old Watson. He kind of disappears most of the time. Um, yeah, Watson, um, early on I decided that I, I couldn't really deal too much with the additional characters of the stories. Um, you know, Mycroft is really handy for sending them places. Um, the page Billy has come in useful. Mrs. Hudson kind of wanders in and out. But I never quite have found a story that Watson will come into his own. I will eventually. Um, I, you know, he, he, he will take a story. But um, I, I'm accused of making Watson just a useless character in the, 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 the sort of um, 50s version of the bumbling Watson. But really, he's quite competent. I just haven't found a story for him yet. The question is the sequence of pairing uh, Russell with Holmes. Um, yeah, I think that from the beginning they were paired in my mind because what, what Beekeeper's Apprentice aims at is it is a coming of age story for a young woman with that extraordinary mind 
that Holmes has. I mean, it's the idea that if you have, if a mind is like an engine, you can use it, you can use one engine to do a lot of different things. You can power a cart, you can pump water, you can, with a basic two-stroke engine, you can do all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you have that engine and put it instead of this Victorian middle-aged male, if you put it into a young feminist 20th century female, um, how would it be the same and how would it be different? So from the beginning, I was looking at them together. Yeah. Yeah, I think that Beekeeper's Apprentice only makes sense if you look at it as the beginning of a series. Because it is, it is, it is not, in some ways, it's not even a novel. It is an, a series of episodes that comes to a novellic ending. But as a, as a story, it is much more a collection of short episodes. Yes. Yeah. Have you found that it was before you wrote, started writing the Beekeeper's Apprentice? And I traveled to England before I started writing. Um, yeah. Yeah, my husband was an Anglo-Indian and he had an English family. So um, I, I kind of married into, I am ambidextrous when it comes to driving and I can, I spell just as badly in English English as I do in American English. <laughs> It was, it's always a great relief when I manage to get my, my text set up with UK spell check, because it, it, you know, it, it doesn't then set everything back into US. There was one book where the copy editors corrected it all. <laughs> it, was, it was painful. Who do I read when I relax? Um, for five minutes before the, yeah. Um, I, I do read a fair amount of crime fiction. I enjoy reading um, first timers because I think that there's always a, some very interesting energy that comes in, or in first time crime fiction. Um, if you're looking for uh, Sherlockian stuff, there's a woman named Lindsay Fay, who is, I, Lindsay is just a great person, but she's also a fabulous <coughs> writer. And she wrote a book <coughs> called um, the Gods of Gotham, uh, about a year and a half ago, that is set in New York City in the mid-19th century at the beginning of the police department. Um, fabulous book, and she has a second one out now that's set at about the same time, about slave, slavery in New York. Um, but Lindsay's first book was a Sherlockian pastiche, and she, that's where her true heart is. I, I, I do read her a lot. Any other, what time are we getting to? Five more minutes. So, any other comments or questions? Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about Garment of Shadows? Garment of Shadows. Um, I wrote four Russells in a row, and for, for various reasons. The first two, the, the first one had that dreadful ending of to be continued, so I didn't have any choice about the second one. Because <laughs> I had to, if, if I had waited a whole year to have the second one come out, uh, people would have killed me, I think. Um, but after that, um, it was the 10th book, and I thought, you know, the, the series has been getting further and further from its original whimsical beginnings. I mean, as, as you heard, she's walking on the Sussex Downs and steps on Sherlock Holmes. I mean, this is not a serious book. Um, but it had, over the years, it had, come, it had become not necessarily darker, but more, um, it, it structured more like serious crime novels. And I wanted to get away, with, away from that. Um, so I talked to my, my editor and I said, look, I will do a third one in a row if I can do a farce. And she said, okay. Um, and I said, Sherlock Holmes is going to get involved in Gilbert and Sullivan. And she said, oh, okay. Uh, she's a long-suffering woman, my poor editor. Um, so that's what I did. It's a farce beginning to end. And it was interesting because I have never before had letters such as I had with this one saying, don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Which at first rather took me aback. I thought, yes, you don't have to buy the book, but don't tell me what to do. And then I, then I you know, calmed down a bit and I, I just would write back at these people and say, well, everyone has a different sense of humor. 
<laughs> However, it meant that I had to then, um, kind of having gone to the extreme and writing this silly farce, um, I then could write a book that basically was a reset. It was as if I'd hit the reset button and I could write a classic a Russell and Holmes mystery, and so I did Garment of Shadows. But having, <coughs> having lived with the characters for four years, I find I, I tend to want to hurt them. <laughs> and, I, and I told my editor this, and I don't think she really believed me until she got the, the first draft of Garment of Shadows, and Russell is waking up with a severe head injury and amnesia. And at that point she thought, okay, we got to let Laurie kind of do something else for a year. So I, I had wanted to return to some characters that I had developed a few years earlier, um, a book called Touchstone, which was set in, uh, in 1926 England during the general strike when everybody assumed that England was about to become communist. And, um, and I wanted to return to these characters because they had some really interesting energy going on between them. Um, so I, I thought, what I will do with this, I will make it a kind of small series and set it at interesting points in Europe between the wars. So um, The Bones of Paris is set, obviously, in Paris in 1929, um, when all of the exciting time of Paris, the energy of the, um, the art world and the literary world and all the exciting energy of creation has kind of dribbled away, and the real painters have all gone to the warmer climes in the south of France, and the writers have gone home, and, and you're left with the criminals and the hangers-on and the drunks and the tourists um, in Paris. And so, and, and you also, this is one of those fun places where as a historical novelist, you can play with the knowledge of the audience. That is, you know when you're reading this book that what is coming the next month in 1929 when your characters talk about how great it is that the stock market is booming, the reader knows, mm, <laughs> don't count on it. Um, and so that's what it is. It's a, it's a book about Paris when all the gold has flaked away and, and it's left with them. Something that from a crime writer's point of view is much better, much better. You don't want characters to be happy. <laughs> really, you don't. Okay, I think we're probably about time because you guys have classes and stuff. Thank you so much for coming out.